Good morning and welcome to Online Church. We are so excited to be with you today. Oh, by the way, I'm Werner. And my name is Alicia and we are your hosts for today. And we are really excited to be with you and we hope that you will be encouraged with our connection time. We are starting off with our new series called Influence and we've got a very special guest speaker here, Julian Adams, that's going to bring the word. Talking about influencing, this week I was reading up about David. In the beginning where we meet David, he faces a giant, but he faces this giant with boldness and strength. He goes up to that giant and says, who are you to challenge our God, the living God, and his people? And then he goes on and kills that giant. In the same way, we are facing giants every day, but we can face a giant with boldness and we can say to it, who are you coming here with your words of discouragement, your words of death and destruction? Who are you coming against God's people? We are victorious. Jesus has already won it. So you and I, we can go out there and tell that giant to die. And it will. And we will kill it because we are victorious in him. Yes, and I mean, you've said it well. <laughs> Next up, our announcements. We've got something very special planned for the kids on the 2nd of August. We are having a drive-by family day and we've got a circus theme going on, especially for the kids because we celebrated the fathers, we celebrated the mothers and we felt like, you know what, let's do something special for the kids. So we're going to have cl clowns, hopefully. We'll have snacks, we'll have coffee for the parents, we'll have prayer for the parents as well mm. and you can all be done from the safety of your car. So please Please come on the 2nd of August from 11 o'clock till half past 12. We hope to see you there. Excellent. And then we have some feedback on our Acts 2 fund. In this fund, we have already given our 23,000 rands of food vouchers to families in our church that are, well, that are in need of food and financial help. So I want to encourage you, please keep on giving into that fund. And then also we have our Acts 19 fund which goes to the broader community. Here we've given our 285 food parcels and 203 vouchers that amounts to 50,750 rands. And I want to encourage you there as well. Please give in to these funds. Let's keep on influencing our family and the broader community of the Midlands and of Howick. Yes, in light of what was uh, spoken of last week, in last week's sermon about generosity, let's keep a hard attitude of generous giving. Mm -hmm. And there are two ways that you can do that, via EFT or via Zappa, and you can find that on the website, theoasischurch.co.za. So the Bible tells us in Isaiah 9, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. And this morning, as we have the opportunity to break bread together, it's just always such a reminder that I am in Christ and he is in me. And this scripture tells us that he is Wonderful Counselor. He is the almighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace and of his kingdom and his peace. There will be no end. And this morning, as we break bread together, I felt such an authority of heaven coming over us to say that our covenant in Jesus is that we get to remind him that he is the prince of peace. And I felt like there's this big wave of fear that seems to want to keep washing over us and rob our peace. But actually, there is no end to the peace of the prince of peace. I am in him and he is in me. There is no end to his wisdom. There is no end to the fact that he is wonderful, that he is a safe place, that he is a strong tower. And as we break bread this morning, I really felt such a grace and an authority to speak into the areas of our life that don't reflect wonderful counselor, almighty father, prince of peace, into the areas of our family's lives that don't reflect those things, because I feel like there's an invitation to remind us that he is the Prince of Peace, that he is our counselor, that he is wonderful, that he is majestic and amazing, and his kingdom and his authority is just getting more and more and more. And so won't you join with me in prayer this morning and breaking bread together as we remind ourselves how absolutely incredible he is. And so Jesus, we just want to thank you 
that you are the Prince of Peace, that you are the God of glory, that you are wonderful. You are our counselor. You are almighty. And right now, we thank you for the peace that you have in our lives, where we feel fearful, where we feel overcome. You are the Prince of Peace and the King of Glory. And we just say yes and amen to your promises today. We take back the lies that the enemy has told us that we get to live in fear, and we establish your peace and your predominance and your glory in every area of our life today in Jesus' name. We thank you for your body. We thank you that we are in you and you are in us. And this morning, as we break this bread, we say yes, Jesus, to every promise that you've given us. And we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your blood that washes us clean. We thank you for your blood that covers every single one of our trespasses, that covers every single disease, that makes us whole, that reunites us with you. We say yes and amen to your promises today. Why don't you make sure that you've got something to break bread with this morning and let's say yes and amen to the promises that God has spoken over us today. Now it's time for our worship. So I want to encourage you to stand up, engage with worship. Put your hands in the air, wherever you are, where you're listening in your lounge or in your car, just engage with God, just worship Him in any way that you feel comfortable. Yes, enjoy. Slow down, take time, breathe in, he said, he'll reveal what's to come. My soul is in the waiting, he's in the waiting, and hold on to your hope as your triumph unfolds, he's never failing, he's never failing. words lead you on do not forget his great faithfulness he'll finish all he's begun so take courage my heart stay steadfast my soul he's in the way Your triumph unfolds, he's never failing, he's never failing. Take courage, take courage, my heart, stay steadfast, my soul.
There are crowns before the Lamb of God and sin. You are worthy of it all.
worship right now. Wherever you are, wherever you sit, wherever you stand. Let's stand in awe of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hello, Oasis. So great to be with you today, um, albeit virtually. Um, I am really excited about this morning. I get to share some things that I believe um, will hopefully shape how you think um, about what God is doing in the earth today. We are living in some incredibly strange times indeed. Uh, a quick family update because I know so many of you um, have been tracking the journey with Katya and I and our family as we have uh, moved uh, from South Africa to America, we landed in Reading initially. Uh, we've been there for a few months and over the last month and a half, we've just moved to the great city of Boston where we are gonna be planting a church called The Table Boston. We are really excited about what God's doing already. We're gathering momentum. We've got about 25 people who are gonna be joining us by the end of August um, to begin uh, being a blessing to the city of Boston to begin influencing and shaping the way uh, God is moving in the city of Boston and adding to what God's already doing. Yeah, so I'm really excited. I want to say uh, just really from uh, the, the bottom of our hearts, we're so grateful for partnerships uh, with churches like you, partnerships with people like Matt and Donny who are just incredible um, pace setters for us. They run with us and help us go after the things of God. And so I'm really excited about what God's doing. Please, we would value your prayers as we are in Boston. Lots of things we still need to sort out. But the family Adams landed in Boston and the table Boston is about to be planted. We would value your partnership in prayer in particular. God is on the move and we get to be part of that in the US, in the great city of Boston. What I'm also excited about is that God is on the move in South Africa. And so it gives me great joy to be able to share with you. I've just released a, a book called Terra Nova, which really is about God's overarching narrative in Jesus in redeeming the world to himself and making all things new. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today, what it means for us to be kingdom influencers. I'd love it if you turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 22. I want to read from verse 24 just very quickly about Jesus and the way that he sees what it means for us to live in this world. It says, a disciple also, uh, sorry, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table, 
But I, talking of Jesus, am among you as one who serves. I love this text because I believe this is the key to understanding what genuine influence actually looks like. What it means for us to be partnering with heaven in redeeming the earth. You know that the salvation story is not just about your individual salvation. We know that the gospel of salvation doesn't have a full stop, but it's actually the gospel of the kingdom. And the kingdom of God really is about his gracious rule and reign covering everything. It's about him releasing his purpose, his will, on earth as it is in heaven. I know this is material that for many of us would seem so familiar and would seem, uh, we'd be so comfortable speaking about it, but for any of us, we don't actually live out, we don't actually incarnate what it looks like for us to live in the reality of another kingdom. Bill Johnson makes a great statement when he says, you will always reflect the reality you're most aware of. In other words, in this context, in this season that we're in, world events that are happening all around us, things that seem to be going the wrong way around, what we are most aware of is what we will most reflect. When you begin to understand that God's purposes have not changed, God's desire to redeem the earth has not changed, the way he is working in his church and through his people to extend this rule of heaven on earth has not changed. He's not removed the boundary lines. He's not erased uh, uh, some of the goalposts. No, no, God is still about reconciling the world to himself and making all things new. It's an exciting reality that you and I get to partner with, that he has invited us to be co-laborers, to be co-partners in making all things new. The reason why we get to make all things new is because our community, our family, the places that we have influence over, suddenly become the prophetic picture of what everything will look like one day, and we then give people an opportunity to, as it were, fall into the kingdom and meet the king of this kingdom. Now, I know that in the world today, we have, um, particularly in the Christian world, we talk a lot about influence. We talk a lot about favor. We talk a lot about what we call the seven mountains of influence, things like religion, things like health and education, entertainment, uh, that have influence over culture and the way culture works. And it can be tempting to think that the only way we get to influence those mountains or those spheres, as it were, was by getting to the top of the mountain and having authority over them in order to influence them. I, I find it fascinating often uh, the church has this desire to make everything Christian. And so we vote for our Christian parties. We want Christian education. We want um, Christian movies, all of those things are really good. They're not bad in and of themselves. And yes, we are called to be salt and light. But ultimately, what we're not trying to do is create a Christian culture and make that mainstream. No, what we're trying to do is create the context in which the kingdom is expressed. Create an atmosphere, a culture in which people suddenly come into an encounter with this amazing king, this king who loves, this king who lays down his life, this king who is for the broken, the hurting, the marginalized, those who've been downtrodden, those who've been moved to the side. He's the one who's come for them. And the way that he came was not as the conquering king. He came on earth as his suffering servant. One who laid down his life, one who embraced a life of suffering, a life of pain, so that we would be those who would demonstrate his comfort, so that we would be those who would demonstrate his kindness, so that we would be those who would demonstrate what it means to bring not only mercy, but the true justice of heaven in which God is exalted in such a way that everything around us becomes the way he always intended it to be. That's what shalom means. That's what peace means. It means God's original purpose being restored to the earth so that everything is the way he intended it to be. And it's so easy to look into a lot of what I would call pop Christian um, social media streams that seem to make us want to get to places of power, seem to make us want to get to the high levels of influence because then we can make a real difference. I want to suggest to you that the Jesus way 
It's not about a position of authority. It's not about a position of power. But actually that the Jesus way is about a life laid down. It's about one that comes to serve. You know, one of the things I'm more and more convinced about is that Jesus is to be our model in everything. And what I love about Jesus is that he is this highly favored son of God. You know, the Bible says that he grew in favor with God and with man. Jesus, when he was getting baptized in the river Jordan, the Bible says that the heavens were torn open and the Father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God took pleasure in Jesus before Jesus had ever done anything for him. There's this beautiful picture of the delight of heaven, of the delight of God, of the delight of the Father to the Son. He is highly favored. This is the one that was resourced with all that heaven has. This is the one who had all authority. Jesus himself says, all authority has been given to me. I, I love this beautiful picture of Jesus, the favored one, the highly favored one. But Jesus' way of using his favor was not the world's way of using favor. It was not the world's way of getting into power to bring about change. You know, the expectation for the Jew in the day of Jesus was that the Messiah would come and he would overthrow all of the world systems and establish a new world order as it were, a new system as it were, a new way of being God's people on the earth and they expected him to do so by force. It's why very often you see little verses and little glimpses where they say things like, and they wanted to make Jesus king by force. Because in their day, authority and power equated to possession, equated to being over something. But when Jesus wants to describe how he uses the favor that he has, how he uses the influence that he has, how he uses the incredible position that he has in uh, the Father as the highly favored one, he does so by saying, hey, do, do you see the world system of the Gentiles? Do you see how they use authority over people? Do you see how they lord it over people, as the Old King James Version says? He says, let it not be so among you. In other words, there must be no hint of hierarchy. There must be no hint of lording it over. There must be no hint of wanting to control. No, no, no. He says, I, I know that it looks like the people of influence are those who sit at the table. I know what it looks like, that the people who have what it takes, the people who have have the big say of those who sit at the tables reclining. I want to say to you, that's not what it's like. And, and the thing about Jesus is his history proves this point, right? He comes from Nazareth. And when people hear about Nazareth, Nathaniel, you know, and John says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And there's something beautiful about realizing that your history does not disqualify you from having influence or favor. That your history is a setup for God's purpose to be unveiled in you. I think about my own life, having been born into a context that didn't afford me any opportunity to study, having been born into a context that was, by worldly standards, less than desirable, yet God now places me in spaces where I get to influence. God sits me in front of educated billionaires, uh, entertainment people, people in the political sphere. I don't have a cooking clue about what any of those things should be doing or how it should work out, but I do have the Holy Spirit. And despite my background, despite my history not setting me up for success, the beautiful thing about the kingdom of God, the beautiful thing about influence in God's kingdom, is that that is not the qualifying factor your heavenly papa is. Because what's true of Jesus is true of us. The same favor that he walked in is the same favor we get to walk in. But the thing about Jesus that gets me every time I read the Gospels is that Jesus' posture was always servanthood. You know, in our position and performance-driven society, we often look around authority in terms of what I get to be over, in terms of what I get to have control over, 
But when Jesus talks about authority in this context, he's very clear that we need to understand that authority is not in order to exercise lordship over someone, but authority is always for the benefit of someone. And the way I demonstrate my authority in the kingdom, the way I demonstrate my favor in the kingdom, the way I demonstrate who I am in the kingdom is not by holding on to position. It's not by being immovable in my opinions. It's not by needing to be right every time. The way I demonstrate kingdom reality of the authority that heaven has now placed on me is through the posture of servanthood. You know, there's a great story where Jesus talks a little bit about what the kingdom of God is like and what sonship is like in the kingdom. And he uses the story of a, a farmer who goes out and he sows seed. And he says, this, this seed is like the sons of the kingdom. But at night, the enemy comes and he sows tares into that seed, into that wheat. And it's an incredible picture. Jesus says, the only way I will be able to figure out who is a tear and who is a wheat is to allow them to grow up together. So that should help you. Your position in the kingdom means that you might be surrounded by people who don't understand you. Your position in the kingdom means that you will be surrounded by an anti-kingdom, anti-Christian worldview. But God wants to make you fruitful in the context of that. And he says, you allow the wheat and the tear to grow together. And as you do that, you'll soon enough see that wheat, when it reaches full maturity, is bowed over low. The head of the wheat, as it were, is bowed over low whilst tears stand up tall and their head is empty of reproductive seed. The reason the wheat is bowed over low is because it is full of reproductive seed. The posture of fruitfulness, the posture of the kingdom extending, the posture of multiplication does not happen by you simply standing tall and exerting your authority over people. It happens by the posturing of yourself as a servant, bowed low, full of reproductive seed. That's how Jesus sees authority according to this text. Friends, brothers and sisters, we have got to be a community who demonstrate that our favor-filled position, our authority in the kingdom is not enforced by our gender or by our position, but by genuinely laying down our life in servanthood in kindness, stopping for the one in front of us. God's called us to be cultural cultural architects, and he wants to invite you to reimagine what your world looks like. God's called us to be a people who think through the lens of bringing the favor that's in us, not based because of man, not based because we've necked, worked our way into those spaces, but based on the fact that we're sons, we're daughters of the living God, and that he's incredibly kind, and that the same favor that was on Jesus is the same favor that is now on us. And when we begin to realize this, we begin to see that God's called us to use that favor, to use that authority for the benefit of others. In our world today, we have many discussions about white privilege and Black Lives Matter, and it's causing incredible polarization. And I know that uh, this is not exempt for any nation, this is for every nation. Even just a few weeks ago, seeing some of the protests that have happened around the understanding of Black, Black Lives Matter, And for many of us, uh, we might think that this uh, is just about skin color. It goes much deeper. It goes toward the understanding of what it means for the sons and daughters of God, black, brown, white, whatever color you are, that we understand that our position is to use our favor, use the authority that God's given us, use the blessing that God has given us. And if you're white, use the privilege that God is giving you for the sake of everyone around you in order to lift them up into a place of wholeness so that we all get to enjoy the fruitfulness and the bounty of God. 
I pray that we would begin to see this as the community of God, that our social media platforms, our armchair critiquing, needs to come from a place of wholeness that genuinely serves and reframes what is happening in our world and re-influences what is happening in our world through the lens of God's kingdom, through the lens of his favor, through the lens of his gracious rule and reign. One of the most stunning pictures in scripture that I often uh, quote is the moment that Jesus is standing before Pontius Pilate because it's one of the most just countercultural moments for Jesus. Here's the king of the universe standing in front of a created being that he formed out of the dust and this Pontius Pilate is saying to Jesus, do you not know I have the power to kill you. Do you not know that I have the power to take your life? And I, I, I think Jesus on the inside must have been thinking, oh my gosh, do you not know who I am? I certainly would be thinking that, but thankfully Jesus is sinless and perfect and he's given me that righteousness. But I can just imagine in that moment thinking, oh my gosh, if only you knew who you were talking to. And Jesus says to him, no man has the power to take my life. I lay down my life. You know, we used to sing that song, More Love, More Power. And we often think of power as a demonstration or exertion of will that demonstrates that I've got more strength or more authority or more ability than the one that is less than me. Jesus, the most powerful being of the universe, is standing in front of Pontius Pilate. He has all authority. He has all power, to, excuse me, to smite Pontius Pilate, yet he says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve. And in that moment, Jesus shows us not what power looks like, but what love looks like. Love looks like a laid down life. And that, dear friends, is where the power of the Christian life is actually found. It is not found simply in the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is not found in the demonstrations of healing signs and wonders. No, no, the, the power of the Christian life is found in a life laid down in love. When we get this, we will start a revival, I believe, of lovers, a revival of people who engage with the world and influence the world, not through their own theological conviction or personal pet um, uh, revelation, but through the place of love. One of the things that Jesus does when he's describing the kingdom is he says the kingdom of God is like yeast. It, it, it's tiny, it fits into almost the nothingness of your hand and you put it in some flour and you knead it and that heat impacts the whole loaf of bread. And when Jesus is describing the kingdom, he's saying, friends, this is what the kingdom looks like. It looks like obscurity. It looks like nothingness. It looks like some heat getting dissolved in a batch of bread. You can't even discern where it is. But here's what happens. The kingdom of God, because of its subversive nature, begins to influence everything and begins to make all things new, the way God always intended it to be. I wonder if you would make a choice with me today that even if you don't get the platform of power, the position of authority, that you'd be willing to be like heat and influence in the unseen. Because it's in the unseen that we begin to see the impact of God's kingdom break out. I want to invite you just in a moment as you're watching, maybe to put your hand on your heart. And I want to ask the Holy Spirit to come. The Bible says that the kingdom of God, the high price, the, uh, the, um, the high expression, sorry, of the kingdom is found in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's known as the spirit of eschatos, the one who brings the end in other words, the things that God has always intended in Shalom, in his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven, that one is called the eschatos, the Holy Spirit. When he comes upon us and he fills us and he, he surrounds us, we get to be 
demonstrators of that influence. God wants to give you favor. God wants to give you opportunity, not so that you can lord it over people, not so that you can use it for your own agenda, but so that you would be a life laid down in love, like he's influencing everything. And just right now, as you put your hand on your heart, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to come and to fill you with kingdom revelation, with kingdom favor, and with kingdom empowerment to be all that God's called you to be. So Father, right now, as people are watching this, I ask you that you would invade their space, invade their temple, and fill them with the Holy Spirit, the one who makes the reality of the kingdom coming now, here on earth, manifested. I pray that in their lives, in their workplace, in their job, that every aspect that you've called us to redeem, that right now you would fill them with the Holy Spirit so that they would fill all in all, every place, in every way, at every moment with the love and the purpose of the kingdom. God bless you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first On The Why discussion. And today, we have the privilege of having Matt and Donnie with us, and we are just getting together and chatting more about Father Heart of God, His Kingdom, His Kingdom here on Earth, and starting off is definitely the Influence series that we did um, this morning that we heard from Julian Adams, and especially about influence, we want to hear from these guys and hear what their heart is about influence. Let's go. Great. Well, it's such a privilege to be here and to share this moment. Um, uh, yeah, the reason we're doing this is just to make what is preached and what we what we kind of declaring every week something that can be applied to normal life. Yes. Uh, so you'll hear some stories, you'll hear some of um, yeah, some testimonies, some of our hearts, and hopefully get encouraged and inspired uh, to walk out a radical kingdom life in the day to day. The 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 stuff that matters most is not what happens when we're sitting nicely in our in our behind our you know, in our Sunday moments, but it's actually what happens from Monday through to Saturday. So this is the this is the goal. Yeah. But we are excited. Incredibly excited about the influence series, um, because it's been one thing that God has been speaking to us for so long about. Um, I'm just so aware that when God said, "Let your light shine," we we are called to invade darkness with light. Mm-hmm. We are called to uh, to where there's death and decay to bring a resurrection life to that that space, mm-hmm. the people, uh, just the culture that um, that looks like that. And so, our influence series is um, is really just trying to give people practical handles. Uh, and really a, a framework around what it looks like to be the hands and feet of Jesus, what it looks like to be the incarnate Christ to the world around us. Um, because Jesus left us with a mission, and that was to go into all the world and make disciples. Uh, and so our, our, my heart is really to equip uh, all of us and to be inspired around what it looks like to be those people that influence the world around us, that bring heaven to earth, that disrupt the culture the, the worldly culture with the kingdom values, the kingdom life, the kingdom truths. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think just to kick off, you know, when most of us think about influence, we probably think about uh, a great leader. We probably think about someone who's at the top of their game, someone who has a lot of money, someone who's got a good, you know, high social status, maybe someone famous, like a famous rugby player or a you know, someone in the arts field. And so often what we do is we look at all of that and we think that's influence. Uh, and so when we disqualify ourselves from any type of, of influence, we say, well, I can't be like that. I can't do that. I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that, that's, you know, those connections. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we look at the life of Christ, when we look at the way uh, Jesus came into the earth his pattern, the kingdom pattern is vastly different. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that during this, this series that you are going to be uh, inspired and, and really all the lies around, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not good enough. I, I, you know, I don't have what it takes are literally going to be dispelled from us so that we can literally start being the people that mm-hmm. God's called us to be. Um, Jesus came into the world. It says uh, in Philippians chapter two, it says he made himself of no reputation. Yeah. So, you know, we always look to the people of reputation to be the ones that influence. But we find that, that Jesus uh, kind of lived a lifestyle where he wasn't concerned about the reputation or the, or the opinions of man. Um, he was after the heart. He was after influencing from a different position, taking on the nature of a servant. 
Uh, that is really our posture of influence is yeah, where sure. we, we don't come in with, I've got the answer. I want to control this. Uh, we, we, not, we don't have to be at the head of our game. Um, we don't have to be, uh, you know, as we look at the spheres of influence at the top of the mountain. Yeah. Uh, mm. And I'm not discounting the fact we need to be those that carry light. We need to be people of excellence. I'm saying we don't have to wait until we in a position yes, to true. influence that we take yes. on the nature of, of a servant just like Christ and coming in the likeness of man, you know, influence is about um, about identifying with our, our you know humanity around us. It's not coming from a superior position. It's actually humility. It's mm-hmm. serving. It's posturing our hearts in that place of uh, of, you know, of of coming low into people's lives, so that they actually um, you know, they, they receive us into their lives. They receive us into the place where we can influence them, and being found. Uh, in human form, he humbled himself. Again, that word humility, that heart that says, I, I, I want to serve, I want to give, I want to I want to go low and go slow in this relationship so yes. I can make an impact. It is what God has called us to. So this, this series is about reflecting the life of Christ, uh, the life that's in us already by the Holy Spirit, uh, and positioning ourselves with the right mindset, I think the right heart attitude, uh, and practical skills on how to bring that into the world around mm-hmm. us. That's our heart. Series. Yeah, I'm reminded of a beautiful story of um, this lady in Africa somewhere. She's got this house that doesn't even have a front door on it. She's got a curtain for a front door. And um, and in, like in most African mm-hmm. countries, there's just poverty, you know, all sorts of heartbreaking moments. And so mm-hmm. she's in her house going, God, I don't know what to do here. You know, I don't have the food to feed my kids. I, I don't know what I have to do here, but I want to be led by your Holy Spirit. And I understand that who I am is somebody who changes oh, the yes. place around me. Yes. Um, and so she just felt like she needed to pray. And so she just spent time praying and listening to the Holy Spirit, praying and listening to the Holy Spirit. And the one day the Holy Spirit said to her, I want you to go and stand on the main street and I want you to just smile and wave at people. Just smile and wave, just smile and wave. (laughs) And so literally she leaves her house with no front door, just a curtain. And she goes and stands on the main road and um, she's standing just smiling and waving, just smiling and waving, (laughs) just like, you know, sharing the love with everybody wherever she goes. And the next minute... This cavalcade comes racing past her and like screeches to a halt and reverses back. And it's the president who has driven past her. And he rolled down the window and he said to her, why are you so happy? And so she said, well, I have Jesus living inside of me, you know. And he said, you have no reason to be happy. He said, our country is in a mess. There is poverty. Mm -hmm. There is sickness. There is disaster. I don't understand why you who I know, I can see you have nothing. Why are you happy? And me, I've got stuff and I'm not happy. Like, what is actually going on here? And she said, well, I've got Jesus and that's all I can give you. So he said, well, I want to talk to you more about this. And made an appointment for her to go into the president's office (laughs) and go and speak to him about the reason why she was so happy. And um, so the next week off she went and spoke to the president. Long story short, she became an advisor to the president of that country from a woman who had not even a front door in her house, you know, she could have easily have disqualified herself and mm. said, I can't bring any influence mm. here. It's hopeless. Like, so, what am I actually going to do in this situation? But what she decided to do was know that influence is not something we do. Influence is who we are because yeah. of Jesus inside of us. Yes, and so um, she believed it. Yeah. And she <laughs> changed what was going on in that nation to be a people who followed Jesus rather than a mm-hmm. people who were just wallowing in their hopelessness and despair. So it really is available for everybody. It's not just yeah. those who, wow. who are in the know or, or are clever or have enough money. Yes. It's for those who follow Jesus. It's so good that you said that it's for someone that actually knows who they are and it's not something that you do. Yes. So the more you realize what Christ has already put inside of you, in your spirit man, then that can come forth. Yes. Yeah. So what would you say is the actual practicalities of living that out, if you can realize, okay, well, I've got this, I do have Christ inside of me, and like that lady went out onto the street, what do you say is like the practicalities of trying to influence your immediate sphere of people around you? Mm. Yeah, I think I think for me, you know, we look through the Bible, there are many examples of ordinary people mm. who realize that they had the extraordinary God inside of them. Yes. Um, and, you know, the more we agree and believe that, the more we identify with that, uh, and the less we identify with all the negative parts of our old nature yes, um, and the lies attached with that, and even our circumstances, the more we realize that actually nothing can stop the influence of the kingdom from just coming 
out of our lives, mm-hmm. you know, and through every part of our lives. Mm-hmm. And the greatest example for me is the, the story of, of 2 Kings chapter 5. And it's the story of Naaman and his leprosy and his healing. But I want to draw our attention to the, the, the mm-hmm. key influencer in that story, which for, for many of us who've read that story, you've probably missed if you, you know, we get caught up with the healing and the miracles. And this was the, you know, Naaman was the commander of, of, the, of, of the Syrian army. So he carried influence by his mm-hmm. position and by what he did. Yet he, was, he, was, he, was, he had leprosy. Um, and I think, you know, so many people that we think carry influence are actually uh, are bound up in darkness. You know, leprosy in those times was um, was a real stigma. It was it was it was kind of like if you had leprosy, you were on the, you were out, you're an outcast. You uh, and it was synonymous with sin uh, in the Old Testament. And so you'll see that this guy who carried inc- incredible influence because of his position and his and his title and all those kind of things was really vulnerable because of the leprosy that the, in his life. And I think, you know, if we look at the world around us, we've got many people that we think are influential, but actually are bound up in darkness, are bound mm-hmm. up in pain, yeah, uh, are, are, are just, you know, just completely needing Jesus. And so in that story, there was one influencer. It was the slave girl that was taken captive from Israel into the Syrian camp. She was serving Naaman's wife. And she said to her one day, why doesn't, the, why doesn't your husband, the commander of the army, go to my country? Because there he will find healing. There the, the prophet will pray, will, 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 will pray for him and he'll get, and he'll get whole. And so um, she relayed the message. And obviously he went and, and I'm not going to go through the whole story, but he got healing. Um, and there, he came back completely changed, completely transformed, completely whole. Okay. And obviously that in his position could influence from that position of, of having found healing and finding and, and, and finding life. But what did that slave girl do? In that place of captivity, she had every reason to let her circumstances stop her from influencing this guy. You know, she was captive. I'm sure she was angry. She was, you know, hopeless, disappointed, all those kind of emotions. But she chose to come above that. Mm. Uh, and she chose to put on love. She chose to put on kindness. She chose to look to the, the, the needs of somebody else rather than her own needs in that moment. And we don't know anything about it. We don't know. Her. She has no title. She's got no position. She's got no wealth attached to her name. She's mm. got no, what is she? She's a slave girl that is in captivity. Yet she becomes the instrument God uses to influence this mighty man that will then influence a whole army wow. and a whole nation. Uh, and so I think the keys is realizing that our circumstances don't dictate yes. um, our, our influence. Yes. Because if she had to limit her influence over this man yeah. and over this nation to her circumstances, she could have backed away mm. from influence and said, you know, I'm, I'm just a slave. I can't do anything. I'm powerless. But she chose to rise above those circumstances. The other thing she chose to do was to act uh, in a way that is um, where the goal was love. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really the goal yes. of kingdom influence is always love. You know, uh, the kindness of God leads to repentance. It's, yeah. the, it's the ways of the kingdom that we operate in, you know, Monday through Sunday, 24 hours a day. When we operate in the ways of the kingdom, love, compassion, mercy, forgiveness, Absolutely. humility, yes. uh, honor, yes. where we speak honor instead of complaining, where we speak positive you know, vision and, and, and prophetic promise instead of negativity and complaint and all those kind of things. When we start to live like that, it's the ways of the kingdom that lead to the king. Yes. And I think that's what the slave girl did. She chose to act in the way that she was you know, she was from Israel. She knew the ways of God. She chose to act in that way. The goal was love. And because of that, um, he got his miracle. He got his healing. And the whole nation was impacted yes. through that. And so two things. Don't let our circumstances dictate uh, our, our level of influence. Because if we do that, we will miss the opportunity to influence the world around us. And number two, mm-hmm. as, this, as this slave girl, as this young girl um, portrayed for us, let love be the goal. And let yes. kingdom values be lived out in our day-to-day life that when people see us and interact with us and are in our company and in our workplaces mm-hmm. and bump into us in the streets or supermarkets, they're experiencing the ways of the kingdom that will eventually lead them to the king. Yes. Uh, and so to operate in that heart attitude of love and, and kingdom values is so critical in our influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say those are two, two things that That's we need to good. give attention to uh, as the mm-hmm. church in this season. So basically, 
for me to just process whatever you said now, for everything you said, um, the bottom line then basically for you to be an influencer or the, um, the qualification to be an influencer is to really just be a believer in God and to bring the kingdom wherever you go. 100%. So that's what qualifies you to be an influencer. Yeah, nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. Right? So who are the influencers? One of us. Every wow. single one of us. That's amazing. That's amazing. I've, been, I've been thinking about um, an aspect that makes our influencing a lot easier, and that is time, mm. to take time, That's to good. take time to notice people. I think one mm. of the biggest um, uh, traps of the enemy is to keep us so busy that mm. we don't take time to listen to the Holy Spirit or take time wow. to notice yeah. people. And, and if you remember in Genesis, it says, God said, let there be light. And there was morning, there was evening, and there was morning. It's yeah. like the very first thing he gave us was time. And time mm-hmm. is a gift in order for the kingdom to be established. It's not a, it's not something that's supposed to be squandered and wasted. Um, and I think as well as knowing who we are, actually living each day with the intentionality of taking time to notice the person next to me. Yeah. The kingdom is established so quickly if I actually notice the person next to me. Yeah, if I actually take good. the time to pray for the one who's sick or take the time to love the one who needs love or, yes. or just notice. How many mm-hmm. times have I wanted to be noticed? If somebody just take time to notice me, my day would have been different. Mm-hmm. And um, there's so many mm-hmm. people who don't even know Jesus whose oh. days would be completely turned on their head. In fact, their destinies would be established yeah. if we just took a bit of time. And I think, you know, even looking at another example, just as you speak about that, when Jesus went to the city called Nain uh, and he influenced that whole city, what did he do? He, he took time. It says, he, you know, when he walked into the city, he was at the city gates and he noticed a widow yeah. who was literally carrying the coffin of her dead son. And it says he saw her and had compassion on her. Yes. And then, uh, then, he, then he prayed and, and the son was resurrected. Uh, and the result of that was that whole city and that whole region, uh, literally, you know, like it's, it says they all encountered God oh, in yeah. that moment. Okay. And so what did he do in the middle of coming into that city? You know, when we want to influence a city as the church, what do we do? You know, we, uh-huh. we do a whole lot of things to try and get noticed. We do a whole lot of things to try and get ourselves into positions of authority. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus literally went to the pain area in a city. Uh-huh. And what did he do? He saw it. Mm. He stopped for the one. Mm. He, as you were saying, he had compassion on the person who was suffering in the yeah. streets. And what it, and in that moment, that compassion led to a miracle. Yeah, so good. Oh. And so I, I honestly feel like if we can get the 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 church to get the the vision that yes. actually you don't mm. need a position in order to influence. You it's need a heart so that's good. connected to the Holy wow. Spirit that is prepared to stop for the one, see that person like an authentic, real, sincere, I want to hear you. I want to hear the pain mm. in your hearts. I want to cry where you cry. And let empathy lead in that in that moment. We're going to see a completely different city around us yeah. because those are that's the gateway. Those moments are the gateway for the kingdom to literally like erupt in our midst. Wow. Um, and so I, I want to challenge us, even in this conversation, stop waiting for a door to open. Stop mm. waiting for a moment yes. where someone mm. invites you into influence. Stop waiting for the platform or the podium or the microphone. Actually, let your life, wherever you go, whatever you yes. do, every environment you go into, be attentive to the Holy Spirit by just being aware and seeing the people around mm. you. Stopping Having let compassion flow out of you, let the love of God flow out of you, and let God do things. Yeah, let step out and risk, and 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 let God bring the dead areas of yeah. people's yeah. lives to life again. Sure. Um, yeah, speak so a good. better word. You know, it's declare good. something different. Be a yeah. different atmosphere to the people around you. That's influence, it and is. that happens all the time, yeah. every day, with every single one of us. Absolutely, that's so good. So, how do we influence? I take it that we influence one person at a time. You take time, you stop, you listen. The goal is heart, the goal is love. And as the kingdom comes, it actually brings transformation. Beautiful. And that's what we want. Yeah. There we go. Absolutely. And it's, it's that easy. It's easy as pie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, guys, for joining us. I think this was an amazing discussion just yeah. to get the heart of um, influence and the fact that we all can do it. It's not just a specific person with a specific position or podium or anything. So get out there this week, risk, yes. challenge yourself, and see who you can influence in, influence in this week coming. Have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Cheers, guys. Bye.
What an awesome word was that today. And I want to encourage you to go out, be bold, and go influence the world and the people around you. Yeah, connect with us through this week, either by social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Leave some comments for us. And then if you want more info on how to join this church, just go to our website, theoasischurch.co.za. Here we have con groups and a welcome dinner. We can get more info. Have a great week. Enjoy, Cheers. guys. Bye.